just want to take a few moments in the beginning to touch on uh, last Wednesday night. So just a few summary things, not very long. I don't try to take much just to recap, but I do want there to always be some overlap and connection on some of these things. So just a, a, um, a quick summary and just hold for the title for tonight. But last time we preached out of dust and we took some time just to define what dust is and some of its places in scripture. And um, one of the things that we identified is it's just something that's carried about by the wind. It's something that's fi real fine. But we took from Genesis chapter 2, where it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In man became a living soul. That dust there even could be translated to ashes or just rubbish, debris. Comes from even this mist or vapor or smoke. We could see that dust is used just to symbolize the most basic element of the human body. So we talk about dust. We come from the dust. We arise from the dirt of the earth and being born of the dust, the Bible tells us that we return to the dust. And so here we are just ashes. God's uh, made us out of the dust of the earth and that represents human life. And we used Job a lot as an example last time on Wednesday night and just his struggle and um, his thoughts on humanity and life. He says in Job chapter 14 verses 1 and 2, Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. That's agitation, turmoil, it's a trembling, it's a raging. Uh, when I was studying the word, it just to me, life is just boiling. Just constant boil, constant pressure. And I kind of use the thought in my mind, of life is like a pressure cooker that uh, eventually the moisture runs out and we just get burned to a crisp. And we, we go right back to ashes again. We go right back to dust. But he said, man is just a born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. That's life is but a vapor, just a mist. It's just a smoke. And no matter how long you live, when you compare our lifespan to even those of the, of the, in the Old Testament, you realize our life is just a very small slice. We come and we go. And what is, what is man? What's left of him when he's done? And just memories. And there's a lot that we could expound upon just how fragile life is and uh, and just how we are just dust, as it were, scripturally. But one statement I want to repeat to you is from the sermon, Letting Off the Pressure. And Brother Bradham, we read this. He says, it's just becoming a neurotic age. Everybody's all built up, haven't got no time. And that builds up to a place that it breaks up things. It causes people to have hard feelings when they snap them off and say things you don't mean to say. Now, everybody's guilty of it. I'm guilty. You're all guilty. We do things under pressure that we wouldn't do otherwise, and there's an excess pressure built up today. Uh, that you, sometimes you read these statements so that you get everybody on the same page. I don't think anybody should disagree with this. I imagine even the youngest ones here would be like, yeah, pressure these days. Man, I got homework. My mom's making me make the bed. You know, I don't get to take naps anymore. Whatever it might be, there just might be some things. It's like pressure's building. I think we can all relate to this. And things just, it's just coming on us. It's pressure. And if you don't have the proper ventilation, if you don't have the proper vent to that, it causes us to blow up. And it causes us to build, builds up and we snap. And he says, we do things. And remember this, under this kind of pressure, you act in ways you otherwise wouldn't act. And sometimes you get experience people under certain situations and they manifest something you're like, oh, I didn't know they were like that. I can say in their defense, they're not really like that, but something made them do it. They, they snapped, they came to a point, they acted out of character. And I can say this just by my own testimony and a time in my life when things were just coming under a lot of pressure. It became evident to me what the impact it was having on me when I began to act out of character. And I realized this isn't, that's not how I think, that's not how I process things. That's not the way I should be responding. So it's really to us a, a warning sign when we begin to snap and we do things we wouldn't normally do under pressure. He says, before I go any further, I might say this, and I'm so glad he does. I believe it's the enemy coming down and pressing. I believe it's the devil. So it's that adversary who's walking about, who makes due use of every opportunity to squeeze you. He wants to put you in that press. He's got, you got a punch coming. So he's looking to put you under pressure, to get you overthinking, to get you reacting. And we know the coming of the Lord is at hand. And the Bible said in the last days, the devil would go about like a roaring lion. And if he could get you under pressure, hurrying, running over something, you'll make decisions that you wouldn't make if you sit down and think it over. Now, there's that contrast of being under pressure. and Life is boiling. It's raging. And this, this natural life is just a constant turmoil, a constant pressure. But what we talked about before is how we could come to Christ 
and that we can let off the pressure in Christ. As we were reading in our family devotion this week, thy loving kindness is better than life. And Brother Branham in Thirsting for Life says, wait, how can something be better in life? And he said, there must be two different kinds of life. And this life is pressure, but his life is release. This life is burdens and turmoil and anxiety and blowing up. But his life is peace and, and, and love everlasting. And it's just, it's a relief in Christ. So Christ is who we come to, to relieve this pressure. And so despite that pressure, we were using a lot just out of dust and God's going to take us out of dust. And we use Job as an example. And he says in Job 29, 18, then I said, I shall die in my nest and I shall multiply my days as the sand. And a lot of translations render that I'll multiply my days as the phoenix bird. And so Job, in referring to this, is a, it's an emblem of the resurrection. This is an emblem of redemption. I know my Redeemer liveth. And though this body be reduced to dust, one day I'm going to come back. I'm going to come forth as a phoenix bird. That phoenix bird burns in the fire, but that is born again from its own ashes and rises up again. It's saying, we'll rise again. Death doesn't even have victory over us. If this body dissolves and if this body's broken down and this body, it, 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 it wastes away, it's, it's going to come back again. I, I've got to apologize. I meant to welcome Lucas and Haley as well, but I, just, I got sidetracked by Judah. So we can blame it on my cousin. How's that? But it's so good to see Lucas and Haley, uh, Haley Coffee here. God bless you. Now you get a shout out that's going to make the cut too. Everybody else is going to get cut off in the archives. You're right in the middle of all of it. Should I start over? Five, four, three, two, one. Edit. There we go. But the, the phoenix bird, uh, it would, it, even in its mythology, it would make its own nest. And there in that nest, he says, I shall die in my nest. It's an allusion to that bird. And there it would burn up. It would die. It'd be reduced to ashes. But it rises up again from the flame, as it were. Rises up from the ashes to live again. And, and that's, a, that's an image to us that Job is pointing to about being redeemed and being restored. Even when something is reduced to rubble. Even when something's been completely destroyed. Oh, my testimony's a mess. My life's a mess. I, 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 it's a completely been reduced to rubble. Reduced to ashes. In other words, it's not that you've made a mess of your finances. You've made a mess of your, of your body with drug addictions. You've been burned to ashes. You've been buried. You've died. God's able to redeem. God's able to restore. So where we ended was how, on God has a plan of redemption. God has a promise to restore us. And so my, my title has been in my heart, just out of dust into heaven. And so tonight I just want to look on this into heaven, but I've put in parentheses Christ because it, 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 this, it's just this image of Christ being that place where we can let go. This place, place where we are relieved. It could have been out of dust into the temple. It could have been out of dust into a number of things, but it's a state of perfection. It's being in Christ. It's becoming Christ-like. And, and I believe it's a place where if you're dust, uh, maybe if we're in the dust and David talks about how I, I cleave to the dust and I'm drawn down and I look down and, and I can't even lift up my head. And he's talking about this depression and this melancholy and this weight that brought him low to the earth. But I believe that even if we find ourselves in the dust, we've got reason to be positive because he's going to take us out of dust. If, even if we're ashes, he's promised he'll take us out of ashes and bring us back again. And this is the promise that's given in Joel chapter 2. As we've read it, we're all very familiar with it uh, as students of the message. And usually with the Wednesday night crowd, you have the benefit of those who are in the word themselves, not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, but they're in the word. And so they know these things. They, they're familiar with them. But the scripture refers to this process of destruction through the, cank the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar and the palmer worm. And Brother Bram gives a lot of attention to these things in the message of the hour and how they brought destruction. And it was this process that ultimately yields death. And God is saying, I will restore. So there has been this process of destruction and ultimate death. No more fruitfulness. It's this the vine dies. And it's why he says, fear not to the land and fear not to the beast, because those things that have been wasted and laid waste, I'll bring back again. It'll spring forth and I'll bring the, the former and latter rain upon the earth. I'm going to bring them together and, and it's going to bring forth a great uh, triumphant harvest. And so there's a great promise to Israel and there's a beautiful promise of the redemption of the body of Christ, his bride. But it's an illusion. It's, he's a, pointing to a time where what has been torn up, what has been brought down and reduced to ashes will be raised up again. 
And we see it's emblematic where there's a teaching rain that goes forth and then there's a harvest rain that these very things, the, the, the harvesting of crops and wheat and fruit speaks of a rapture. So it's a, it speaks of a translation. It speaks of us coming to the ultimate of redemption. Now, if you could see what God is saying, fear not and be glad for the Lord will do great things. The, the, these, these, these locusts and these stages, Brother Bram talks about it, the same uh, insect has torn everything down. And, and, and you look at it and says, I'll never get a harvest again. I'll never get fruit. We'll never be able to enjoy these things. And there's maybe some uh, sadness. As you see that scene, we were painting a similar picture last Wednesday night. I think it's when it dawned on me that I thought I was going to be a great encouragement and then realized three quarters of the way through, all I've been doing is talking about Job. And realize, man, you know, if you're trying to compare, make people happy by saying, hey, at least you're not Job, it's probably not going to work, right? I'm like, well, Job didn't have a car. Job didn't have to worry about a mortgage, right? I mean, there's, we'd have a way just to think that Job had it easy. But still, uh, there was, it was something when we compare as we went through those steps on Wednesday night and think about life and how hard it is and what we endure and what we go through. Right? This life is very, um, there's a darkness to this life. There's a darkness to this age that we're living in. And it's a reality of human existence as the Bible describes this as um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we're all uh, just going to eventually back, end up in a grave as it's alluding to. It says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. It would be one thing for him to say we're just all an unclean thing. But then to say even our righteousness is as filthy rags, it says no matter what we're doing to be good, no matter how, what kind of morality we might have and integrity we think we might have, it's just all doesn't compare to the glory of God. And being sinful creatures, it's not going to change anything. She says, and we all, we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. This is the reality of humanity. This is what we are. Uh, this is the reality of sin. This is just the reality of our existence. A man born of a woman is born in sin. And sin did my mother conceive me, the psalmist says, that we come forth into this world with the stain of sin upon us. We're as an unclean thing. Any good we do as unclean creatures is still as a filthy rag because it carries with it the stain. It is, we are just dust, moved about by whims. We're moved about by nature. We're moved about by the, the shifting sands of time. This is just life for us. In Psalms 102, verses 1 to 14, originally I kind of had some of these things just put together, thinking we might just do a study in Scripture. Go back and read uh, all of this psalm. It speaks of the prophesies of this end time. But I wanted just to take the first 14 verses. It says, A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. And just now somebody has made this their favorite Scripture. A prayer of the afflicted when he's overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. So this is this supplication, this crying out from one who is afflicted. He feels overwhelmed and he's pouring out and his complaint. It's not like a, you know, a survey you fill out or you, you want to you return something. Or, I, we got grievances. Uh, it, it's not necessarily that, but just your situation, your, 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 st your status, what you're going through. Hear my prayer, Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Well, life, a man is just a full day, a few days and full of trouble. And it says, incline thy ear unto me in the day when I call, answer me speedily. That's a language that Jesus uses when he talks about uh, the just crying out to Christ and, and the, the righteous saying, oh, Lord, avenge us. The elect crying, he says, I will avenge them speedily. Uh, there's something about our cries that go up to him and the, the prisoner, as the scripture comes to, we're, be, we're locked up in a prison. We're bound by death and we have this, this appointment with death that's coming. So we're bound up in this flesh. We're bound up in this dust and we're crying out, loose us, O Lord, loose us. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? He says, for my days are consumed like smoke and my bo bones are burned as a hearth. There's this image of just uh, of the hardness of life and even what it ends in. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. So much imagery being offered to us in this. A pelican of the wilderness, an owl of the desert. There's, there's maybe something incongruent with the image that he's thinking of and 
uh, 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 there's some despairing of life. There's something that's lacking. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. Are you encouraged yet? <laughs> Somebody's reading Job's diary. But now the scene's going to change. It says, but thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. I love how it sets the scene for us so we can understand just the beauty of the prophecy. If man wasn't full of sin and uh, condemned to be lost, I mean, really, just how excited would people be about a Savior? If Israel hadn't been in bondage, just in the, in the kingdom was perfect and they had great glorious kings, how excited would they have been about a Messiah? So it has to appropriately paint this picture of this doom and gloom, not as a, a misrepresentation, but just the reality of how we live and our lives. It paints that picture, but now it mentions, Lord, you're great. You endure forever. Your remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise. And have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. And, and this, as this is prophesied of, of Israel, we know that the bride, she's to come on the scene in the last days. And there's a time and a place that's appointed for her to rise. And so Zion is even a reference to the bride. Brother Branham says in one place, it's always the bride. So there's some application to us as his Gentile bride and as the body of Christ, though she may be able to say as, as a prayer of the afflicted, she may be able to say as one that's overwhelmed, one that's suffered, one that's gone through church ages, one that's been torn away, one that's been brought to the ground and goes back into the ground. The Lord will arise and have mercy on Zion. There will come a time for him to have grace and favor upon her. Amen. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So here is a prophecy, not so much at the moment that it's going to be completed, but even at a time when it's completely in ruins and it's been reduced to dust, He's saying, thy servants take pleasure in their stones. They're looking upon them. They're considering them. And they even have mercy and pity upon the dust. There, there's a love for it. There's a longing for it. There's a burden for it. And looking at it, it's like, oh, I, I, I'm not dismissive of the dust. I'm not dismissive of the rubble. Uh, what it used to represent, what it could have been, all the glory that was referred to it. There's some connection it has with it. And this, the writer's using it in the sense to kind of take the picture. Oh, I know something's going to happen because even your servant's eyes are turned to the dust. There's even a, a longing and a burden it has for the rubble. And, and if I could say this about whatever condition your life is in, I don't I despise it. Don't disregard it. Don't, don't, walk away, don't necessarily walk away from the ashes and say it's all ruined. But look at the dust and know that God is able to bring beauty out of the rubble. He's able to build again. If God could make man out of dust, if man was made from ashes, then you, you know that God has all the material he needs to bring forth something glorious. And so here's a great prophecy of though this darkness of affliction and being overwhelmed, God is able to raise up from the dust and redeem Zion. If you continue to read this beautiful prophecy contained in Psalms 102, it's one of my favorite chapters, not because of verse 1 in the intro. But Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14 as well. There's a, so much in this. I'm just wanting to preach it and not stop too much on this, but it's just so chock full. But here we see another image of something coming out of dust. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And so this is an image of death and not just death, but long death to where it's not a rotting corpse, but it's been reduced to bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And he says, and lo, they were very dry. There was no strength in them. Uh, they would have been maybe breaking up and, and brittle. So he's wanting to say these are dry. There's no, there's no strength in them. It's not recent. But these are those that have been dead for some time. 
And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? So it's the hand of the Lord that brings him to this place, shows him this valley full of bones, and he deduces from it in the way that he's shown it that these are very, very dry. These bodies are long dead. They've been reduced to maybe, I, and I'm not just trying to speculate and make it fit my prior title, but maybe they're dusting a little bit. Maybe they're brittle. Maybe they're breaking. And the, the, he's asked this question. The Spirit of the Lord asked him a question. Can these bones live? And he's got the right answer in, verse, in the next statement. He says, and I answered, oh, Lord God, thou knowest. And, and what a statement. It's not, I just love even uh, the confidence in God uh, to say that, uh, you know, well, if you were just, if it was up to me, of course not. Uh, um, bones don't live. And, uh, um, and, and these things, this just isn't common. But he says, Lord, you know. So there's some deference to a God who has the power. Just like uh, Lazarus' sister said, oh, uh, even now, Lord, I know that whatsoever you ask, we could have. That there's some, there's some belief that with God, all things are possible. And I answered, oh, Lord, thou knowest, in verse 4, and he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, I want you to key in on that. What's the secret of dead, dry bones what, what can have an impact on ashes? What can have an impact on the dust? What is it that can take a lump of clay? What is it that can take a handful of dust? What is it? Where is the power? What does it reside in? Oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. That, that's the fullness of the statement. Prophesy, hear the word of the Lord, bones, and this is what you're going to see. Breath will enter in and you shall live. And then it kind of steps back a little bit to describe it. And I'll lay sinews upon you and I'll bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Notice how he says, hear the word and you're going to live. And then he kind of gives more description to the process. So then he says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a shaking and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. Now, this is the, the stage at which God brought Ezekiel to the valley was not at this point. Because just maybe some conjecture here, had the hand of the Lord been upon Ezekiel and the Spirit of the Lord takes him out to the valley and he said, I saw uh, 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 people and I saw them, I saw the flesh of man arrayed a certain way and I saw them dressed and I saw the skin. Uh, his, the image would have been very different. But now this goes from dry bones to flesh. With sinew, they would have been upright, skin covered them and the only thing that he could remark is that there was no breath in them because he knew that God said, not only would I lay sinews upon you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin, but I was going to breathe. He knew there was a promise that he wasn't just erecting a lifelike statues. He was going to bring forth something that would have breath, something that would have life. So he says there's no breath in them. So despite those stages of restoration, there still was something else to happen. Uh, listen, I say it today to not, don't stop short of a total deliverance. Don't stop short of the full promise. We say, well, it was, I was dry bones and now bones have come together and sinews and tendons have come and skins come back. I, I'm happy just to have skin. No, if God promised you breath, you don't stop till you get the breath. If God's promised you 100, you stay with it until you get 100. I think it was someone at the Mesa church who wrote the song 99 and a half won't do. I, I, I don't want to sell myself short of his promises. And it said in verse 9, then he said, he unto me prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man and say to the wind. So notice the, what the, the very thing that's going to bring these things to pass. Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds. Oh, breathe and breathe upon these slain that they may live. They'd been slain. They'd been reduced to ashes. But now they come back up to this process of restoration. And for some people that might have been good enough, if people just look, they'll think it's a church. You just get them to look the part. So I prophesied, verse 10, as he commanded me. I love how there's this image of a prophet bringing the word of God as he's commanded. And it's in with that dynamic that says, and the breath came into them and they lived 
and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. We know that with true revelation, the bride will be an invincible army. It says, and the breath came into them and they lived. And not only did they live, they stood on their feet and became an exceeding great army. This breathing is, uh, it points us to the breath of God. All scripture is given by the breath of God, the inspiration of God to where there's a, there's a breath of God that goes forth. And therefore, as God is giving breath, you breathe that in. And the word of God is God's breath. The word of God comes from his mouth. But as you eat that word, you're breathing in God. That's breath. You're breathing in his life. You're breathing in his, inf- his inspiration. And the breath of God goes forth. The inspiration of God goes forth. And he breathed. But it's not just getting lost in the ether. It's, it's mouth to mouth. It's l- life coming into your lungs. It, it's power. It, 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 it's, a, it's a supernatural power of God. It's the life of God being breathed and you don't just feel it you breathe it in and it being breathed in life comes in and it animates you to be an invincible army an exceeding great army and I want to continue to read to verse 14 then he said unto me son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel behold they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost we are cut off cut off from our parts now, this is, this is the, it's kind of, as we read it this way, that this is the way it begins, just like Psalms 102. And you see a connection between those. This is, this is Job on his ash heap. This is, this is that, oh, her bones are dried, her hope is lost, we're cut off from our parts. Israel is separated, everything's in disarray. He says, therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I'll open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. And bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O oh, my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Now we know that Brother Branham, when he preaches the seals, and we have the overview of the church age book, that Brother Branham is saying that the church was dead. She is in a grave, as it were. And even when we come up to the time of the seals, he says she's still dead as a doornail. And there's been no manifestation of God to wake her up. If I could put it this way, breathe into her the breath of life and cause her to stand on her feet as an invincible army. And he talks about how what a resurrection this is. So there's a resurrection out of the grave of dark denominationalism. There's a resurrection out of sin. There's a resurrection out of Laodicea. And this promise to Israel has a beautiful spiritual type to the bride and a very literal type to all the redeemed who will come up out of the graves at the time of the great translation. It says, and I shall, and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, that I the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. He will cause the dry bones to live again. Though the valley may be full of dry bones, though it may wander through a spiritual desert, though it might seem to be forsaken, there will come a time when the valley is no more dry bones. When God pours out His Spirit in such a way where it's the Word of God being received into His body to animate her and to cause her to stand and be an exceeding great army because God promised He will restore her. And the restoration of the bride tree, Brother Branham is taking a lot from Joel chapter 2. And he's going through the steps of showing that there were four different stages of the destruction. And how that it was locust and then canker worm, caterpillar and palmer worm. And that it was, he calls them four death messengers. And each one eating away different parts. He goes into great details in this, uh, in this sermon, restoration of the bride tree and other places. And, and there, I had a lot I wanted to read to you, and I think we're doing awesome on time. And, uh, and so I'm just going to, I'll try, I'm not necessarily going to try to go quickly, but I'm not going to belabor some things here. And I'll just come to this part where he says, four killers took it, four messengers destroyed it. Four messengers of death took it away in dogmas. So now there's this stage of destruction. He says, four messengers of righteousness restore it back. Now, to this point in the sermon, and some of the things I'm skipping over, was a lot of references to Joel 2 and the four death messengers. And then he's also referring to, he comes back to it again, he refers to four life messengers. And I love it when you get to four, because a lot of people who only add by threes, all of a sudden you get to four, and it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop. 
Uh, but we don't ever use numerology to leave the word. Right? We, just, we just want the word. Types, shadows, numerology isn't what's so important. It's the truth that's important. And so here is a truth that we could see in the word of God. Now, Brother Branham says he's, he's been looking at Joel 2, but now he says, prophesy, son of man, can these bones live? Prophesy, can these bones live? Now, he has taken Joel 2 and this process of destruction and he begins to marry it with Ezekiel 37. And, and, he, and you, could even, you could even begin to see that there was these stages of bones coming together, sinew being added, then skin. And there was this noise and shaking and there's this restoration that takes place where you have what looks like bodies and people. But then the observer, the prophet says, there's no breath in them. And Brother Branham is now bringing Joel 2 where it had four death messengers and he connects it to Ezekiel 37. He says, what's the four stages of the coming forth of that church? What is the four stages of Ezekiel's dry bones coming forth? So this is the prophet kind of tying these two things together. He says, but the life only come not when the sinew skin was on them, but when the wind blowed upon them. That's when it come back. That fourth message of life was brought back. I will restore, saith the Lord. He says, hallelujah, glory, praise be to God. And I, I second that. He says, the fourth light is to come that will bring forth the same signs. Justification brought back the pulp. Sanctification brought back the bark, doctrine of holiness. What brought back the leaf? Pentecostals. What is it? Pentecostals, leaves, clap their hands, joy, rejoicing, Pentecostal. So there's your three stages of restoration to that point. He said the fourth was the word itself. There's a lot that we could show that the baptism of the Holy Ghost made way for the Holy Ghost itself. That he forms the wheat outside of those three stages. The, those three stages are critical. But he even put the Pentecostal Laodicean age as the shuck. But it's got to come back to seed again. And we're not creating a, a doctrine of fours, but it's the truth and reality. That as God uses these three stages, but then the ultimate product comes back to the original. Three stages of restoration, but the original is the final climactic. This last great step must come into perfection, he said. You have repent, you have justification, sanctification, the seal of God, which is the new birth, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Those three stages make the new birth, but then the last great step is into perfection. We've had the, the restoration uh, of the new birth and we've had certain great truths restored to us. But there's got to come a bright age to this. There's got to come an exodus, an Ephesians age, a harvest time. Amen. So he says this fourth was the word itself. The word made flesh. Fruits of the proof of the resurrection sign. That Christ has finally, I hope you can catch this, finally, after justification being planted, Sanctification being planted. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. Organizations died out. This is a phrase to me that's so beautiful. And Christ has again centered himself like that cap of the pyramid. Amen. This is what it's got to come to. As Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Places this more uh, uh, permanently, I guess you could say. Christ has centered himself like the cap of the pyramid. First line, justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Ghost, then coming of the cap. He said, what is it? That Holy Ghost bunch. That maybe that could be a cover band for the believers songs. The Holy Ghost bunch. The Holy Ghost bunch being honed out so that it can fit with the same kind of ministry he had when he went away. Now, then when he comes back, it'll catch the whole thing in the rapture. When they're justified, sanctified, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Christ has to come through that and center himself again on the pyramid. He's got to come back and make himself known, unite together with it, catch it away in a rapture. He says this, the pyramid will stand again. Do what you want with it. It's going to stand again. I, I, don't cap it off. He'll cap it off. Reduce it to rubble. It'll stand again. He says, the house of God will live again. This statement has been at the heart now for my heart for several months. It's been kind of the inspiration even behind preaching on the house of God. The house of God will live again. If there was a time
time where it was thriving and it was busy and everyone was in their place and the God, presence of God was being made known and it was glorious and it was beautiful and the kingdom was at its peak and it's reduced to rubble and it's forsaken and every all its instruments and everything is taken away and broken and the priesthood is fell and it's reduced to rubble and it's reduced to ruins and it's reduced to ashes and dust. The house of God will live again. Carry all its instruments to the four corners of the earth. Bury it in the sea. Burn it to ashes. God will raise it up again. He said the tree of life is growing again. I can say it of this bride time, this harvest time. This is the time of redemption. This is the time when these things are being restored. What he's talking about is coming out of dust into Christ. It's a, it's a statement that serves my purpose for my titling, but... Taken it from ruin, from the one who's afflicted and overwhelmed, from the one whose days are consumed like smoke and groaning as a prisoner, who's hated, whose days are like a shadow which declineth, who's withered like grass, the Lord will behold from heaven, will look down from his sanctuary to loose those appointed to death, to build up and to bring forth Zion. It's the time when he is going to breathe the word of God into your hearts through the opening of the word to bring you back to full life again. Full manifestation. In Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 4, just a few people reached out to me after last Wednesday night and just shared some things that came on their heart. And it was, it was Ezekiel 37. It was Isaiah 61. You could just see. There was already this uh, part in your hearts, like, yeah, this is what God's doing. It says, the Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. You can see some continuity with Psalms 102. You can see so much in here. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And in his first coming, he stops. Jesus doesn't read any further. And so there's hundreds of years, almost, almost 2,000 year comma. And the day of vengeance of our God. Right. Which Brother Bram says this, this time. Right. Uh, this, this, the preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is related to his first coming. Now he's still Christ who binds the broken heart, who proclaims liberty. The opening of the prison to them that are bound. But he stopped at the day of vengeance of our God because that relates to the time we're living in now. Now the day of vengeance of our God continues to comfort all that mourn. And now there's a new appointment. If you read in Psalms 102, I realize now some of the things I cut out in the book of Psalms might actually leave, leave some of this out. Aren't you glad you have your Bible? It says to hear in Psalm verse 20, to hear the groan of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death. And here it says that there's going to be those appointed to death. But he says, I'm going to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. He changes your appointment. I had an appointment to get a, um, a feeling back in, I can't remember when it was sometime last year and I had a little bit of a cold and wasn't feeling well, so I canceled it. And guess what? <laughs> I haven't made a new one. Right? Don't you wish you could do that sometimes? You can cancel appointments and never have to worry about them again. But this is a, this is a change of appointment. To appoint to them that mourn in Zion, those that are overwhelmed, those that are afflicted, those that have been reduced to, to rubble, those that are mourning, repenting in their ashes and dust, to give unto them. This is your new appointment. To give unto them beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And that's what he wants to do is you're sitting there with the spirit of heaviness covered in this uh, in sackcloth, covered in ashes. And you're mourning. And you have a spirit of heaviness. And you're covered in ashes. And he says, let me have the ashes for beauty. Let me have your mourning with the oil of joy. Let me have your heaviness and give you a garment of praise. What is he going to do? What he takes away, he gives back something. He wants to restore you. He wants to exchange. He wants to give you a new appointment. Oh, I wonder if any of us tonight are willing to let go of our mourning for the oil of joy. If we're willing to let go of the spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise, are you willing to let go of the ashes for beauty? 
that we might be called the tree of righteousness, the trees of righteousness, the tree of life growing again. He says it's going to come back to her, the tree of life. That's you. We might be called the trees of righteousness, the plant of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Even though it might have been for a long time tore down, there will be a people that will be the restoration, the finality of all that's been destroyed, all that's been defeated. It may be dust, but out of dust, God raises it up. It may seem to be just ashes, but God can do beautiful things with ashes. It's actually going to turn your ashes into beauty, your mourning into joy, and your heaviness into praise. I would even, you know, just take some liberty here at the end of this service to say he's going to turn those ashes into beauty. He's actually going to take your mourning and turn it into joy. He's going to take your heaviness and by the spoken word of God, make it praise. And so if the devil tells you, we're nothing but ashes, mourning, and heaviness, it's like, well, those are all the elements of beauty, joy, and praise. Those are the things that God uses to produce praise. Those are the things that God uses to bring joy. Those are the things that God uses to bring beauty. Hey, if you're rich in heaviness, you're going to be rich in praise. If you're rich in ashes, you're going to be rich in beauty. Oh, think about it. We should not be defeated no matter what it is, what's been, and what's happened. God has made me a promise. From death can come life. What's the worst you can do? I could murder you, kill you, burn you up, and throw you in a grave. Even from that, from the de depths of the sea and from the valley, wherever I am, I'll hear my name and I'll come forth. There's no victory in death. There's no power of the grave because from the waste from the desolations there'll be repair there'll bring a ra there'll be a raising up because that's the God I serve thank you Lord Jesus out of dust into heaven I used heaven just to describe a perfection a relationship with Christ it was Inspired to me as I was studying on Esther too. It just connected where Vashti is this uh, presented kind of as an evil queen. Refuses her husband. And the king says, take the throne away and give it to one who's better than Vashti. And it comes to Esther. Esther chapter 2, I believe it is. He says, and the king chose her, brings her to the royal palace. And she was made queen instead of Vashti. And when you think about it, Esther is one, I th we think we've shared this before, and I think it's just something that's uh, in the scripture, it's often expressed. She, her, her original Hebrew name was Hadessa, which is myrtle tree. It's earth bound. And, and it carries with it, it's uh, in myrrh, bitterness. It speaks of death. It's the cycle of life and death represented even in a tree. And she's changed from myrtle tree to Esther, which is star. And as, the, as Brother Branham talks about in some places, and as we see in the scripture, this image of being brought from the dust to the heavens. She's brought from a tree to, to the heavenlies. And this is what God does for us as humanity. We're born of a woman. We're just a few days and full of trouble. We come into this earth stained. I, I, we're not like Adam was in the beginning. We're not, it's not like it was then. Our lives are so untethered from the reality that God had originally placed it. And life is headed. It's a, it's a race to a grave. Everyone's appointed to it, but there's this story of redemption that God is going to take us who were earthbound, headed for a grave, who uh, Satan even felt he had ownership. He argued over the body of Moses because of sin. He goes, that's my meat. I have the right to eat that. That's the serpent's bread. I have a right to that body. I have a right to that flesh. But God says, I'm going to bruise, crush your head, and I'm even going to take those who succumb to death. I'm going to raise them up out of their graves and give them glorified bodies and there will be a people who are alive and remain who will not taste death but will be changed in a moment in a twinkle of an eye and will be exalted from the dust to the stars. Amen. And Brother Branham says, where, where can we put this woman? Where can we put her? He said, she's exalted to the very throne of God as the only place befitting such a queen. From dust to a throne. Out of dust into heaven. 
into Christ. And so I, I leave you with this lengthy statement from the sermon, The Absolute, or Absolute is what it's called. It was March 4th. That's a, that's a command. March 4th. And he said in 1963, and if you recall the settings of this, and I'd like to get into this in more detail uh, later on if the Lord would allow me to. He is asked to go speak. He's asked to go and uh, speak at this prayer meeting because a young man and a young woman were facing the death penalty. And so it was, uh, kind of, and he was, had relation to another minister there, the, the young man did, I believe. And so there was just a real urgent time. If you could just get this in your mind, there's a time where the penalty of death is being held over someone who's guilty in, in the eyes of the, of the prosecutor, who's, where there was guilt in his life, if we could say that. And so, Brother Bam, I'm speaking on this, and I don't want you necessarily to get your mind working in that, but now just make this very personal as we close on this. Remember how that we began last Wednesday and reminded you today that there's such a pressure that's being built up till you come to a place where you break, you snap, and you do things that you wouldn't normally do. Brother Bram says, now, if in your life you have an absolute, you do things ordinarily you would not do. Okay, well, I thought that was, I thought we were going to end on that one. Okay, well, let me, let, me, let me try it another way. Okay, should I take my coat off? I'll, I'll say it louder. Oh, I know what I can do. If your life has an absolute, he says you'll do things you would not normally do, especially if you have a God-centered life. The God-centered life makes a person do things that ordinarily they would not do. So there's an opposite to this. There's a life that we live that we're forced to do things we otherwise wouldn't normally do. It's out of character. But there's also a place that you can come in Christ where if I'm in the dirt, I'm in the dust, and I'm being pressured by this world, I'll do things I otherwise wouldn't do. But I can also come to Him and give vent to my frustrations. And when I have an absolute and I have a God-centered life, it'll make me do things I ordinarily wouldn't do. He says, very odd, peculiar why is a Christian life so odd and peculiar? Because they're looking to God's word, which is almost foreign to the world today. That's what we're looking to. We're looking to God's word. The world sees you burdened. The world sees you down in the dust. The world sees you on the ash heap. And it's expecting you to curse God. It's expecting you to act out of character. It would actually say, hey, buddy, I don't mind if you cuss. I'd do the same thing. It, they don't mind. It. They understand. I know why he went crazy. I know why he did this. They can relate to it. But there's a people who could be in that very same circumstance and say, you speak like a foolish woman. Why would I deny him now? Why would I give up now? Why would I lose my hope now? Why would I act like that? Why would I lose that? Why would I lose my control? Why would I give in? Why would I snap? I've got a promise in him. Amen. Job served a God that could turn every single one of those pieces of ashes into everything he had lost. He was sitting on a gold mine. And he says, why Christians are odd? It's because they're looking to God's word. He says, now we have a churches, we have organizations, we have religion. Oh, so much of it around the world. But that isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an absolute connected with Christ. Then it makes you an odd person. You do odd things. Your thinking is altogether different than the thinking you once did. Because you found something. That you've anchored a faith in someone that created the heavens and the earth. That his very word itself is creative. A God who spoke the world into existence... And there's nothing too hard for him. I'm, I'm, just, I'm wanting to end on this statement just a way of kind of summing up this out of, out of dust into heaven. I, as a way of just to encourage you, just give you something positive to go forward in. He said, the very word is creative. It's a God who spoke the world in existence. And there's nothing too hard for him. That's what you who are under pressure are looking to. And that's why you act odd and do things you ordinarily wouldn't do under pressure. So you're going to act out of character either way. Or you're going to do something you wouldn't ordinarily do, but it could be negative or it can be positive. He says, so you're looking to the word. You have an absolute where you're connected with Christ, where there's nothing too hard for him. And listen, so it makes you creative. Yourself, because you take his words. It makes you creative. 
It gives you power. Why? Because the word has gone forth and you've breathed that in. You're connected to it. You're tied to it. And a word is a thought expressed. He said Paul had to go into that state where he had to, not a theological experience, but he had a personal witness. He met God. And he knew that he was called of God. And nobody had to tell him anything about it. He was absolutely sure that God still remained God. If the world could just do that. Remember that group there that night was fearful of death. It was coming. It was at their doorstep. And if this group tonight sitting here could just remember that God is still God. And I'm I'm not saying this to those who are in Houston. I'm not repeating this to remind people in Houston. But I say it to us here tonight. If this group could just remember that God is still God. There's nothing too hard for him. He's the one that created the world by his spoken word. And that word is in you and it makes you creative. Remember that he's still God. He's just as able to answer in this case as the is it a case of divine healing or anything else. You recognize just the parallel that we can make now. Sometimes we say, well, God said he's a healer. He'll answer healing. And we think that if we're sick, God's going to come on the scene and heal our bodies. But here was a court case and a trial and, the, and the, the possibility of a death sentence. He says he's able to answer in matters like this, just like he is in divine healing. So we could just take that and extend it out. Whatever it is, he cares. If it concerns you, he will perfect that which concerneth you. That God is mindful of what you're going through. If I can say this, if God's servants would favor the dust if they would look favorable upon the ruins then what do you think God thinks when he looks at you he sees in you the beauty of that new Jerusalem he sees the purchase he sees the power he sees the glory he sees the beauty he's not giving up on you he says I can do this I can heal you I can raise you up whatever it might be he says he's still God in the case of divine healing or anything else he's still God And if we can build our hopes, not only our hopes, but a positive thought upon what he says. Invite the musicians to come. And we know that it is the truth. And people act funny. Think of this. Think of this. This is the part. Just coming to, I know it's lengthy. Uh, We're not going to get into an after hour tonight. So we're just right here in this moment. He says, they seem to just forget about the negative side. Because they found an absolute because it's the word of God. Can I just challenge you with that tonight? There's a little bit of a reflection in here. They seem to forget the negative side. I just wanted to say it to me. I want to forget the negative side. I know I spent a lot of time in these last two services talking a lot about the negative side. But we've got to come to a place where we just seem to forget the negative side because we found an absolute. And he said, well, forgetting, I can't do that. Well, yeah, because that's divine. Hey, to, to forgive is human. To forget is divine. But he says, forget about the negative side because they found an absolute. Jesus said, heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never fail. So if we got the word of promise, then there's no failing to it. It cannot fail. So I'm believing that that's what the prayer meetings here, the religious people of Houston are interested in, human lives. And that's what we're gathered here for, is to call on a power that's beyond all man-made laws and powers. Something who could change the hearts of men like he did Pharaoh in Egypt. And he's still God. But he says this to these people in desperation and maybe people so closely connected to it. There there was maybe a lot of fear and maybe too much aware of the situation. He says, and we must stop now looking at the negative side and go to looking at the positive side. And that's what I want us to do. Turn our eyes to heaven. Turn our eyes to the word of God. Turn our eyes to Jesus Christ. Away from the negative side. Let our eyes behold heaven. Let our eyes behold his beauty. Let our eyes behold his perfection. For I am no longer earth bound. I'm no longer dust bound. But but I have begun to rise. My, My heart is set on heaven. 
I, I'm like that boy who's holding onto a kite. I can feel something tugging on the other side. The morning, uh, the sunlight has risen and I feel something pulsating within me. This is the day to rise and shine for my light has come and I'm not left in Laodicea. I'm not earthbound. I'm not discouraged. I'm not defeated. My flesh may feel so and there might be a lot of negative side but oh God help me tonight. May I be one who can look to you and call on a power that's beyond man made laws. That's beyond the rulers of this land and stop looking at the negative and look at the positive. Help me Lord to do that in all things Father. Help me. Help me to do that Lord in all things. Let's pray. Oh God we pray tonight that you would help us to not look at the negative. Lord, in this, maybe this two part, these companion services last Wednesday and tonight, we focused a lot on the dust, seemingly the negative side. But Lord, I was so wrapped up in the thought that even while I was describing mankind in such horrible terms and using the example of Job, I, it never dawned on me just how dark it could seem. Because even in the ashes, there was beauty. Even in the suffering, it's pregnant with glory. That every, every ounce of pain is a seed of promise. Every hurt, every bruise, every harm, every lie, every wound, every sin, Lord, everything that we could think of, every speck of dust has the potential of glory because of your word. And Lord, even as we would describe a valley full of dry bones, we know what it's going to be. So we do not look at dry bones as the evidence of death, but we see in it the potential of cartilage and tendon and sinew and muscle and skin. And we see the promise of the wind to breathe into us the breath of God. And Father, if Paul could say, I know all things work together for the good, then may we, Father, believe that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. That my past, my rebellion, my suffering, my stains, my sins, even my memories, Lord, I could be brought back to things and be so burdened with the negative. I want to start looking to the positive the positive that I'm justified, the positive that I'm sanctified, the positive that I'm a son and daughter, the positive that I'm rising to meet you in the air. And Lord, may we be a people. As Brother Branham admonished that group in Houston so many years ago, may we be a people that doesn't just look to the negative, but looks to the positive. And with all of our heaviness and all our mourning and all of our ashes, may we realize that those have the potential to become beauty, joy, and praise. Lord, I pray for your people tonight as they sit, Lord, if some standing, some with lifted hand, whatever they may have in their hearts, I pray that you would encourage them tremendously, Lord. Take us out of dust into Christ. I commit them to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.